All right, we're going to get started tonight. And this is a very, well, very, very special program. Obviously, we've all been brought together by someone we respect and love uh, very much, Hannah Block. Um, uh, okay, give me one sec here. I'm so organized that I'm a little disoriented. <laughs> How's that? All right. Okay, so welcome all of you to Poetry at the Albany Library. And um, we thank Friends of the Albany Library for making this program possible. Um, I realized as I was preparing for this that this is the fifth time that Hannah has read for us at Albany Library. It is not the first time that she has brought friends, but this is really special. Um, she first read for us in 2008 with her book, uh, Blood Honey, and then she read for us with Anne Barrows to commemorate Kristallnacht in 2010. Uh, in 2011, she brought her pal Tess Gallagher, and that was quite a special night. And in 2012, we celebrated the fabulous online magazine Persimmon Tree, um, which Hannah has been involved with, I believe, from its inception. Um, in fact, she was its first poetry editor. Okay. I wanted to say something about Hannah's, Hannah's readings um, and how, and I have to say, I, most, I, I experienced this most dramatically uh, at one of the uh, Judith Stronach lectures when she gave a bit of poetry. And there's absolutely transformation that happens within her and around her. Um, in, in the animated reading of some of the po some of her poems that especially that involve other other people and it felt as though all of a sudden there were like you know three to six people right on the stage with Hannah and I was watching a play not listening to a poem this is Hannah this is her writing this is that animated quality of her spirit whether she is speaking to you quietly about something, you know, very important or philosophical or, or uh, you are having the pleasure of her humor. Um, so I am very happy that Hannah wants to celebrate with her students tonight. We celebrate that Hannah is here with us. We are celebrating her new book. We are celebrating friendship, and we are celebrating a very essential part of Hannah's life, her role as a teacher. Um, of course, we all know about her, her wonderful work as a poet and her prizes and um, all the acknowledgement in that area. And um, her new book is, is gorgeous and wonderful and, of course, gives us a taste of some of the history of her work. Um, her work as a teacher, which I'm sure she will say something about as well, is, um, is so important. It's really quite wonderful to see so many of her students here. And um, I, I just wanted to also say and that Hannah is, in a way, always a teacher in the generous manner in which she shares not only her work, but herself. And at this difficult time in her life of dealing with health, she has very comfortably shared that process as well, appropriately and comfortably, and invited others to talk about their experiences. And it is an area in which people can help each other. Um, she talks beautifully about writing and about going through periods like this in one's life and keeping hold of one's passion. And, and how does one do that? How important that is? How 
how do you nourish it and how does it nourish you? And so I want to recommend two interviews that have recently been done with Hana. One, um, now we've got my organization. Um, one in talking about writing, uh, Carol Dorff, and coming out or should be out in Persimmon Tree, the March issue, with Wendy Barker, um, also a wonderful poet and um, will probably be reading in the 2016 um, season here. Um, I, I highly recommend both of those interviews and feel just so happy and so blessed to be introducing Hannah Block tonight. amazing just to see you all. I haven't seen some of you for 20 years and I think you haven't seen each other for 20 years. So I don't know what to say. That, say It feels like we're in a church and, and I'll be preaching to the choir. <laughs> and it feels like we're having a camp reunion. But maybe it should be a Mills fundraiser. <laughs> How come they're not here from, from, what do they call it, development? <laughs> so first of all, I want to say, Catherine, where are you? Catherine, I want to say a big, big thank you to Catherine. When she and I first talked about a reading at the Albany Library, she said, who would you like to read with? And if I had singled out one poet, <laughs> Her task would have been a lot simpler. I said, I'd like to read with my students. I have no idea how many hours Catherine must have logged, how many emails she must have written, what algorithm she used to work out the timing. So all of this with her customary graciousness which I really appreciate. Thank you, Catherine, for making this possible. There are a few people who have kept poetry alive in this area after the death of Black Oak and Cody's, and Catherine is one of them. During the past two years, as many as of you know, I've been dealing with an aggressive sarcoma. I am so glad to be here. I am so glad to say I am in remission. And I'm, I'm so glad that all of you could be here tonight and to celebrate with me poetry and life. Teaching at Mills, what can I say about teaching at Mills? I loved it so much that I would sometimes stop in the middle of a class and pinch myself and say to myself, they're paying me for this? <laughs> I, I was just having the time of my life doing it. It was almost as good as being a mother <laughs> and like it in some ways. Um, I am so happy that so many of you have continued to write seriously and to have this a big part of your lives. A friend of mine was looking at the program and she just kept saying, wow, 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 is it possible? And you've done it all since you left Mills, which is remarkable. I'm, what? What about Mills? So to, I, I'm going to close the evening at this time by reading a, one poem, but I'm going to start the evening um, by reading, I, I've chosen 10 poems. 
um, from new work from Swimming in the Rain and a few of the poems from my last book, Blood Honey. So I didn't want to repeat myself. In my last reading, um, I read poems about sex, love, and marriage. So I've chosen to focus on art tonight. <laughs> poems mostly about art and music and poetry. And I should say that when I think about any kind of art, I always think about poetry. And when I think about poetry, I often think about sex. <laughs> so, so this is a poem about painting that has to do with sex, and it's called Beaux-Arts. And it's a painting of Courbet's L'Origine du Monde, The Origin of the World, painted 1866. Very controversial in its day. It's a female nude, but to be more exact, it's a close-up of her crotch. <laughs> and the, it's in the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. The first line alludes to Auden's Musée de Beaux-Arts about suffering they were never wrong, the old masters. Beaux-Arts. They knew something about pleasure, too those painters, how well they understood. It may be compounded of the simplest elements, the merest trace of water or light. Courbet's L'Origine du Monde, for instance. The bedclothes are thrust aside, and a woman's fleshy thighs sprawl across the canvas toward you as you approach. Courbet studies his nude with the diligence of a lover and lets you see in the reddish fur at the body's threshold a hint of wet, like the dab of white in the iris that lights the eye. I, I love the way Courbet accomplished so much with a single stroke of paint. And I think that's what we try to do when we write poems every time we choose a word. This one is called Portrait of the Artist, and it's about the art of painting and of poetry. And the title refers to the poet and the painter. Portrait of the Artist. He showed me the painting he made of me. At 80? 90? Clearly, he didn't mean to flatter. <laughs> now he asks if I'm planning to write a poem about him. He's smiling, but under that brushed-on smile, he looks worried. <laughs> There's a couple of things he'd prefer to spare the reading public. Who wants to be published, stripped to his cotton socks, with nothing but a fig leaf of metaphor to keep him decent? Sweetie, it's not you in the poem. It's you ground to grist and pigment <laughs> with all the others. Don't you know what a poet can do with a blank sheet of paper? <laughs> Words are the poor man's colors. Listen, I promise I'll change your name, and I'll never ask you to pose legs crossed, eyes bright, cheek nuzzling your hand. Don't move so I can get you just like that. Move all you want. I'll get you. <laughs> I've, been, I've been getting you all along. <laughs> this one is called The Memory Artist. And I think there's been a lot of research on how memory works. And this is anyway the way my memory works. And it's also my particular aesthetic. The memory artist. The memory artist has a brutal aesthetic. Delete, delete. Obsessed with endings, she's known to cut out 
the beating heart of what happens. She understands everything backwards. That's why she foreshadows the past, foreshortens the past, gives it an elegant taper that looks like fate. We were so happy at first is allowed a single line in the authorized version. <laughs> and what about the beginning? The startled kiss when the paint of day was still wet, the moment still opening. She's an artist, you understand. Gifted, but troubled. Don't trust her. Not for an instant. Not with your life. <laughs> One of the hardest things about aging for me, and I'm going to be 75 in a couple of days, is losing words. Um, so this is called the sixth age. Words slip from me lately like cups and saucers from soapy hands. I grope for the names of things that are governed, like me, by the laws of slippage and breakage. I am like a child left behind by the fast-talking grown-ups, a tourist lost in the blind alleys of a foreign language. How will I see my way to anywhere without my words. I slam up and down the stairs of our house. Where are my glasses hiding? <laughs> Rimless, invisible as oxygen. I need glasses to find them. There must be words left to go on searching for the ones I've lost the way the blind man I once loved found me, first with his fingertips, then with his whole hand. <coughs> so also about aging, this is about youth and age, and it's a painting of Rembrandt's that I fell in love with. I love his self-portraits of himself as a young man, and I especially love the ones he did of himself when he was older. Um, and this one is based on a painting called Self-Portrait with Two Circles that he painted around 1660. So he died, I figured it out today from Wikipedia, <laughs> He died at 63, so he must have painted that painting when he was in his 50s. Um, in the last three lines, I'm imagining what that expression on his face is saying. And I have one word to explain, a mall stick. Um, from, um, it was a kind of light stick with a padded leather ball at one end, and the painter would hold it against his chest and against the canvas, and it would help him to keep his hand steady. Late self-portrait <clears throat> after Rembrandt. The mirror is quick to assess him. He declines to humor it with a smile his hundredth report on the loss of illusions, lines scored in his brow. Forget the young man preening in velvet and bravado, his elbow planted on stone. Now it's the mall stick that steadies his hand. The master at work in his painter's cap, the self in that portrait has the heft of impasto, a life laid on year after year. Canny eyes, clown nose, the mouth defiant. 
I've seen what passes for beauty in the world. Let someone else pay tribute. So shortly after Rembrandt was painting, another artist, Stravari, was making his violins. And um, it was a period of cold climates in Europe, and the coldest time was the 16th and 17th century. There are scientists who believe that the dense wood in the Stradivarius violins accounts for the quality of the sound. And some scientists say that the cold was one reason that that wood ended up being so dense. However, there are scientists that say it's not true, but it's, it's a hypothesis. Um, page 31. The Little Ice Age. Europe shivered for centuries in the Little Ice Age. Rivers froze, crops failed, people chewed on pine bark, implored the stubborn heavens, Lord, have mercy. That's why the Stradivarius cries so convincingly. It's the wood remembering, the stunned wood shuddering, too numb to grow. The tree rings huddled close against the cold. This is also about a painter. One of my favorite painters is Mark Rothko. And I love the paintings of his that are luminous colors. You all know the reds and oranges, they're so vibrant. And do you know what he did as he got older? His canvases got darker and darker and darker. There's a chapel in Houston called the, the Rothko Chapel where there are 14 of his paintings, like the 14 Stations of the Cross, and they are so dark that they look black. They're actually, there is no black in them, but it's layers and layers of very deep color. And that was what he painted in the last six years of his life, before he took his life. The Colors of Darkness, Rothko Chapel, Houston. Oh, and I start with an image of photography, but not really photography, amateur snapshots. The Colors of Darkness. Flash after flash across the horizon, Tourists trying to take the Grand Canyon by night. They don't know every last shot will turn out black. It takes Rothko 60 years to arrive at the rim of his canyon. He goes there only after dark. As he stands at the railing, his pupils open like a camera shutter at the slowest speed. He has to be patient. He has to lean far over the railing to see the colors of darkness. Purple, numb brown, mud red, mauve, an abyss of bruises. At first, you'd think it was black on black, something you don't want to look at he says, as he waits, the colors vibrate in the chasm like voices. You there with the eyes bring back something from the brink of nothing to make us see. There is a Berkeley artist who brought back something from the brink of nothing. I don't know if you know the work of Gail Antical. She invited me to her studio one day when she was working on a series of drawings, some of them images of the Holocaust, and she used as her medium flower and ash. We talked about her work, and I quote some of her words. Um, and I have a disclaimer 
the first line has nothing to do with a god-awful film that we have all heard about. <laughs> Flower and Ash. Today, she is working in seven shades of gray. <laughs> she tacks a sheet of paper to the wall, primes her palette with flour and ash, applies the fine soft powders with a fingertip, blending with her thumb. Make flour into dough, she tells me, and fire will turn it into food. Ash is the final abstraction of matter. You can just brush it away. Day lilies in the flush of summer about to be fall. Her garden burns red and yellow in the dry August air and is not consumed. On her studio wall, a heavy particulate smoke thickens and rises. Footprints grime the snow. The about to be dead line up on the ramp with their boxy suitcases ashen shoes. She hovers over her creation as if she too has a mind to brush against it and wipe it out. So two more poems. One, I know exactly when it was written, and I'm reading it because of the circumstances of its writing. I wrote it two years ago just about two years ago, two years and one month ago, when on a day when I showed up for a crucial scan and was sent home with the words, come back tomorrow, the scanner is broken. So it was a terrifying day and I wrote, and most of my poems I write in re retrospect, I look back at something and try to make sense of what happened, and this one I wrote minute by minute as it was happening. Um, inside out. It is either serious or it isn't. The indeterminate mass 14.8 centimeters long is either a cyst or a tumor. If a tumor, either benign or malignant, if malignant, either slow growing or aggressive, in which case they may contain it. If not, no one else will recall this unseasonable day of waiting exactly as you felt it from the inside out. The way the heat of your mind dropped a few degrees and grew very quiet. The sediment settled. You managed to divert yourself with words. Then you consulted the uncommon clarity of the sky, a mild translucent blue, a sign perhaps. The leaves held still in the almost imperceptible breeze, though at the tips of the branches, the first buds of spring were so close-fisted, you couldn't be sure whether you saw them or not. And I'll end with a poem about a person who was much in my mind these past two years. Some of you have heard me talk about him or read about him before, Mark O'Brien. Or if you saw the film, The Sessions, you saw a pretty good version of who he was. He was a poet and a journalist who had polio, and he lived almost all of his 50 years in an iron lung. And he was astonishing. He's one, he was one of the wittiest people I ever met. I used to bring him dinner and, and talk to him because he was so fascinating. And he, he, the way he lived in that cage 
was in- astonishing. He embodied the the notion that you can choose your attitude in any set of circumstances. So um, I was asked to write an essay about him when that film was out, and the I worked on the essay before I knew anything was wrong with me, and it was published just after I was diagnosed. So the effect of doing that put Mark into a region of my head where I have kept him very carefully and where I could consult him and where he told me lots of important things. So this is called The Color Green. In memory of Mark O'Brien, two floors up, at the corner of Hearst and Shattuck, he's clamped for good in an iron lung. When it's time to eat, he inches his head a sweaty mile to the edge of the pillow. It takes a while. His brilliant bloodshot light blue eyes steer me from cupboard to fridge. He would like his chicken burrito cut into bite-sized pieces, a bent straw for his glass of water, please. How does the body live its only life in a cage? I watch him compute the distance from bar to bar and squeeze between them with a violent compression a fury of bursting free that doesn't last. His will is a crowbar, angled to pry up the rooted, intractable weight of matter. I watch him slyly. I check out the way he does it. He does it but pain in its absolute privacy weighs what it weighs. I come here to study the soul, posing one question a dozen ways, most of them silent. If I'm only a body, he laughs, I'm up shit creek. (laughs) His laugh, a gritty eruption of rock, salt, and breath. Like me, he writes poems, but he does it letter by letter on a propped keyboard, the mouth stick wobbling between his teeth. That kind of speed keeps a poet accountable. (laughs) He won't ever say, the grass is very green (laughs) when it's only green. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for thank you for that reading. All right, um, we're going to proceed with Hannah's students. Um, we've we've listed everybody who is reading and a little bit about them in this in this program. I hope there are enough um, to have gone around. Um, and what I'm going to ask is that each of you, as you when you come up to read, just Uh, if you would tell us your name and then carry on. And this is actually a pretty tremendous collection of of people. Um, This is going to be really a lot of fun. And uh, then we will stop and have a special break. I hope all of us will, you know, stay together for that. And we will um, pick up with more reading um, at the end of that break. All right. So I, I will... I will say that we are beginning with Jacqueline Berger, and um, we will carry on from there. Thanks. It's really wonderful to be here and to honor Hannah. Um, 
I'm going to read two poems, and I know in the interest of time I won't do any introductions. I'll just say MFA 1995. That was fast. (laughs) The routine after 40. Because my mother doesn't ask questions, not the way I would, grilling the oncologist until she ripped a corner off the examining table paper and drew it out, I don't really understand what it means to have the markers for cancer. But later in the week, the the technician giving me a mammogram is surprisingly clear when I ask her, and reassuring. Everyone's body produces cancer cells all the time, she tells me. She's blonde and ample, looks like someone who could fix a leaky sink, then make a pie to take to a party. But we slough off the irregular cells, catching early whatever bad is pitched our way. Listening to her, I love my body, its diligence, the work I know nothing about. Markers in the blood show the body no longer able to do this. I've shed my paper jacket, the one handed to me so I would feel less naked as my breasts lay on the glass plate like fish on ice. When the jacket slipped, I let it fall. So now I'm standing here topless with a little sticker like a pasty on each nipple, a reference point for the radiologist. The technician and I have passed the formality of modesty. Bad things bombard us daily, but for years we are stronger than what will kill us. You can get dressed now, she tells me, but what I want is to put my head in her lap. Have her stroke my hair while I tell her how much I will miss my mother when she is gone. The markers of grief. Because my body will accommodate the vast loneliness of my life without my mother. My head in the technician's lap. Her fingers lacing my hair. Tell me again about how hard the body tries. How most of the time it wins. Gin. I like a green olive stuffed with a pimento after it has been submerged for some time in a martini. I like to go downtown with my husband, sit in a booth at the Grand, and let the drink rub the edge off the inane fight we had about the furniture salesman, and whether he treated us fairly, my view, or whether he tried to put one over on us, my husband's view. In some moods, we'll fight about anything, just to make the other carry the weight of anger we lug all day through our lives. But that moment, when we climb into bed on a winter's night, letting our bodies lie down, letting the day be over, is not unlike the way gin loosens the rope, lets float the raft into its stillest waters. Happy hour. When the landscape loses its daylight meaning, as it slips into the silk of dusk before night pours down its jazzy notes in a cathedral of crushed velvet. We are sitting side by side in the booth, watching the flurry of holiday shoppers come in from the cold. By now, the salesman is a jerk, or he's a hell of a guy, either way is fine. We are talking about anything, having drifted out into the calm plainness of intimacy. Nothing profound, just a place to rest at the end of the day. The cord between us swinging gently after the bells have stopped their ringing. Patricia Casper's uh, 2001. Thank you for inviting me. Your mother tries to describe tree blossoms in her neighbor's pasture, how she can see them in the gully below as she and her dog, Frankie, step from the red clay of the ditch tender's trail into the narrow bend toward home. All week, she tries to tell about the white blossoms apricot, apple, or plum, she's uncertain. And also about the sniper on trial, or the sniper who was killed, but you weren't listening. 
you turned off the radio and the TV too, because some weeks call for that kind of silence. Now, driving your mother where the two-lane road cuts through blue oak savanna, the fields green despite winter, despite drought, she quiets the music to talk of the soldiers, a wolf, legend, and the actor with his quick bulk. She wonders at the nature of the brain of a man with a gun, good and evil. And you have something to tell her just as you pass that pasture, the gully, the tree with petals like white votives flickering in the dusk. What was it you wanted to say? <clears throat> Losing your daughter in the bookstore. You're in the scene from every mother's thicket, dark dream. You turn back from the book of artists and your daughter is not where you left her. Half in this world, cross-legged on a story hour carpet, half floating in a mud pond with frog and toad. She's only a few steps away, you guess. Turn another corner and another until you're traversing the bookstore, tightrope breathing, calling softly. You don't want to embarrass her. After all, she's no longer the lost toddler in bus station nightmares that rush, that rush your heart and wake you, dawn startled. How long were you looking at that damn cassette anyway? You cast a net of senses, become the espresso machine's gasp, the sweet scent of magazine ink, a shiver of pages. You call louder. Try not to trod patrons as you hasten from aisle to rack. Glance at the shame-faced parking lot. Kidnapped. It happens. No time for her scream. You are about to scream. You choke on a throat full of air. Tilt your head back to bellow her name. And oh, there she is. A blossom girl, grown into ripped skinny jeans. Blonde light behind Austin's paperback portrait lingering sudden grace against the banister, whispering Darcy's proposal to herself. <laughs> I wrote this poem for my son. Losing your breath for Seamus, atheist, age seven. <laughs> it isn't something you misplace. A piece of galactic puzzle slipped into the pocket of a too small winter coat and forgotten. You wake in the night and try to capture the air. Some sort of July firefly, you can't swoop into the mason jar of your lungs. But your lungs are not glass. They're tissue, muscle, and cartilage. Millions of capillaries waiting for that old magic trick of oxygen. The night we raced through the mountains, winding fast down sugar pine lined roads, the sky black before us was no comfort with its bright spectacle of constellations. Each breath you wheezed became our rosary as we carried you across the empty hospital parking lot. And I thought about the small mystery inside of you, struggling to hold on to this life, this body machine. It's everything I know of God. Thank you. Janie Dresser, class of 92, sprung. This summer, I will not be working for US Safety Corporation, building you a better seat belt. I'll no longer twist the long black tongues of stiff nylon thread through a plexiglass shock box filled with gears and levers to snap each into place. It was my job to check for resistance, Chuck the ones that didn't lock into the red cart, the others in the green. Good luck. 
You won't find me taking my stand with the rest of the girls, our hair tied in braids, buns are wrapped in scarves, our hands circling above coiled springs, popping across conveyor belts before we dab the thick brown grease into each, guarantee for smoother wind-up and release. In case of accident, pray. This is one damn summer I won't shout over busted machinery or keep my brown bag lunch off the equipment on the floor. I won't miss the red-haired foreman telling us to knock the small talk off. Watch him, my mouth gone numb, fire the black guy with no explanation. I'll miss farewell picnics on the sun-baked blacktop lot because I'm no longer one of the girls. You won't catch me slacking in my used Nova, day after day, loud day, rolling the window down, cranking the AM high as she'll go. There is no safety strap in my car for the long drive home. This summer, the only time clock I'll have to punch is that dull gray box that keeps rattling its tick, tick, tick inside my head. <laughs> Branches. The boy was pinned under it. He was breathing, but barely. The men came shouting through the forest. They had a saw and a rope and an old rag. It was the cloth that caught the eye of the deer watching from a pine break. Red and wounded, clipped by deadfall below the moon branch, it had seen the tree lurch and crush through the wood as if giving chase. The boy who once climbed to its topmost branch, who raided the bird's nest, now empty, now scattered. Twigs askew, shocked from the hand of the bent-backed boy, now downed. Above, the patient Merlin halts a female sparrow's flight in one sure, quick dive. I'm Judy Halevsky. I graduated from Mills College in 1998, and I am having a wonderful evening hearing this beautiful poetry. Hannah, it's so wonderful to hear your poems and your delightful students. Very honored to be here with them. I came to Mills College from the east coast of Canada, and Hannah was my advisor, and I, I, I had been to Vermont once before I came to California. <laughs> And she was kind of my lifeline to the world. And I went in my time at Mills from thinking about poetry as like some books on a shelf in the library to really seeing poetry as vibrant and alive in the world and really a world form. Um, and I went on with Hannah's influence to study other languages and to live other places. Um, and I really want to thank her for really opening the world up to me. Um, so I'll just share one poem tonight um, about my journey. I, I um, lived in Japan for a lot of years, and I studied Japanese and haiku, and um, now I'm kind of studying the, the poets that influenced haiku, um, the Tang Dynasty poets, and this poem comes from that. It's called Dear Li Po. A million times I read your letter. I know what you mean about sadness being the easy way to go in a poem, about Americans being spoiled, I can see how you might get that idea. Trust me, a cruise ship isn't a good example. I'm glad you liked Melbourne, and I'm sure the Galapagos were amazing. I'll look up the pictures on the internet. That's a new kind of library. More on that another time. <laughs> the cream they put on their skin is to block the sun. They want to stay young looking. A tan doesn't make them less white. It's complicated. Let me just say, the war was a kind of storm. I sat in my kitchen. I wrote sad poems. My dear Joshua joined the army. He loved the uniform. He loved jumping out of planes. He wasn't in the helicopter that crashed. He was part of the crew that cleaned up the wreckage. They found the pieces of bodies and cleaned them and put them in groups and sent them home. He survived. We eat at taquerias and see movies about Britain. 
We plan family trips to the mountains. Spoiled, yes, in many ways. I came only with your poems. I read them the night the train left Oakland. By Portland, I was beginning to doubt the translations. I kept going. We walked to the seawall in Vancouver. My father said, where are we? Where are we? It's morning here and the middle of the night in China. I keep all your letters. I promise I won't sell them at auction. I promise no more sad poems. I'll write about the rain and these mountains and how very young I am and how writing to you is just like talking on the phone. Let's make a plan to drink and hike. We can meet at base camp. I'll bring you a rainproof coat. They sell beer in cans there. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I, I too would like to make a little statement about Hana, what Hana has, has meant to me. Um, I'm Dorian Lowe. It's okay if I, am I pronouncing my own last name correctly? <laughs> you know, you don't always have to say last names out loud. Um, It's really worth getting. I'll be right back. Excuse me, thank you so much for graciously waiting. <laughs> Any poem I've written is in debt to Hana, who taught me how to be precise, direct, and remain cool under pressure. She taught me the importance of images and language and gave me confidence that what I saw could be seen by others if I was willing to look long enough and hard enough. She taught me patience. My first book especially is indebted to Hana, who sat with me for hours poring over the manuscript. I suppose I remember most the poem Sunday, written in response to Stephen's Sunday Morning, which I studied at Mills. I worked on it a long time, and it was finally accepted for publication by Five Fingers Review. I remember that the editor wanted me to change something, and I went to Hana and asked her if I should. We discussed it and decided, no, I wouldn't change it. But she told me to write a letter telling him why. It was like a mini thesis defense of the stanza in question. The editor wrote back and said, you're right. And the poem stayed as it was, thanks to Hana, who also taught me how to argue effectively. The poem ended up closing my first book, Awake. And here is the poem. Sunday. We sit on the lawn, an igloo cooler between us, so hot the sky is white. 
Above the gravel rooftops, a spire, a shimmering cross. You pick up the swollen hose, press your thick thumb into the silver nozzle. A fan of water sprays rainbows over the dying lawn. Hummingbirds sparkle green, bellies powdered with pollen from the bottle brush tree. The bells of 12 o'clock, our neighbors return from church. I bow my head as they ease clean cars into neat garages, file through screen doors in lace gloves, white hats, Bible black suits. The smell of barbecue rises, hellish thick and sweet. I envy their weekly peace of mind. They know where they're going when they die. Charcoal fluid cans contract in the sun. I want to be Catholic, a Jew, maybe a Methodist. I want to kneel for days on rough wood. Their kids appear in bright shorts, bathing suits, their rubber things, their rubber thongs flapping down the hot cement. They could be anyone's children. They have God inside ti their tiny bodies. My God, look how they float like birds through the scissor, scissor, scissor of lawn sprinklers. Down the street, a tinny radio bleats. The sun bulges above our house like an eye. I don't want to die. I never want to leave this block. I envy everything, all of it. I know it's a sin. I love how you can shift in your chair, take a deep drink of gold beer, curl your toes under, and hum. <laughs> My little timer. Did it start? No? OK. There we go. OK. Um, it's wonderful to read with Hannah students and to celebrate Hannah. Um, I want to start with a line from Hannah's poem, Conduit, because it has a number of meanings for me, which I'll share in a moment. Um, the key to the safe is under the sugar bowl. When I was in college for my BA at Mills, I'm Rusty Morrison, by the way, um, uh, so many decades ago now, it was um, 1978 when I graduated. Um, and I had both li many literature classes and workshops with Hannah. Um, I could see in her teaching and in her writing the openings to a life that I had not believed was possible for me. I felt seen by Hannah. Uh, she treated me as if I were a poet and a woman who could work in the field of literature. This is not something I understood from my family or my childhood. She opened a door in my heart. She was not overly sweet. She was no sugar bowl. <laughs> but she was genuinely and genuous, gener generously interested in what deserved interest. I found myself wanting to bring ideas to her classes that deserved her interest, and to bring ideas into my poems that deserved her interest, and that would in interest me in the way that I saw them interest her. The keys to hidden places are hard to find. She knew that one needed to start with a kind of sweetness. It's a sweetness to oneself first. It's a kindness. She taught me to look there, under the sugar bowl, beneath it, and to trust that the keys I'd find there would be to places in myself that would be worth looking for. So um, thank you, Hannah. Um, just probably one poem. So this is called, Everyone is Noah. Through her bedroom window, window the future is not visible. Only the pine tree is there, losing its needles to canker. They are green needles, turning already a gentle brown, making the ground a soft place to walk. 
It's a good place to bury the ashes of her dead, if ash will let itself be buried. Ash poultice on sunrise. Ash is matted in twilight. In her window's corner, she tapes a holy card kept from the childhood that she had to remember the green her faith's gilt edges have turned now. At night, the future turns like a curtain in wind, obscuring the figures hiding behind it. It turns like the tone of a voice speaking for so long in her ear that she no longer hears it as a foreign language, a language that she'd wanted in her childhood to learn, which might be green, still ringing in her ears now, dispelling balance in the same way that grasses widen the wilderness that they grow from, both above and below the ground. I'm Taya Schaefer. When you're done listening to me, you get to take your break. <laughs> As I was listening to people introduce themselves, I realized I might be one of the most recent Mills graduates here, which might also tell you I've taken a very slow path. <laughs> a Mills 2003, thank you, Hannah. First poem I'm going to read refers to 1967, um, I think there's a bunch of people looking around the room who can remember 1967. Uh, though the word is, if you can remember it, you didn't really live it. Um, 1967 was the summer of love. Uh, it was a time when we didn't yet have the word dysfunction to refer to certain families. And when it was really scandalous for a girl to travel with two boys cross country. Um, I didn't make it to the summer of love, like I said, Mills 2003, you know, life was slow for me. I tried, though. <laughs> the time I tried to leave home for California. That day, two of my sisters know what is coming and split before I make for the door with Peter and Vince, summer of love, and my father there before us, hand on the lock, shouting, he'll call the cops, say they've stolen the jewels, and mother yelling, she doesn't have a penis, she can't go. <laughs> and none of us able to laugh, only very nervous smiles. And then the boys are kicked out, and I wild sprint after. The youngest siblings caught inside with their noses up against the door glass as sun sets on the neighbors with a cop car and my parents pressing charges, and neighbors saying if he had a hairbrush and I were his daughter. And for weeks after, I can only leave the house if my little brother's attached. And I take Janie to the principals saying, my sister's in your school and there's trouble in our home. And he says, if I had a hairbrush and you were my daughter, that was the time my parents told my sister they'd keep her locked up if I ran away. And she told me, run. <laughs> the following year, I made it to California. And I also made a best friend for life. Now, as a lesbian who's lived her entire adult life with a straight man. It gets a little confusing to explain. <laughs> but this poem is for him, the home front for Richie. Because we leave home with our genders on, when I write us, we are nameless. I scrape butter across the toast. You scoop bread through yogurt. In the newspaper, other rhythms. It is 2002. We are going to war. We are resisting the war. Everything is worse than it has been. Police and soldiers, 
lives wrenched apart, the inevitable pleasure as we commiserate before entering our separate days. I bring five senses of imagination to war. They stop at the brink, the meaning of acrid when placed next to gun. Your childhood also eludes me, the mother whose lullabies predicted her early death, the city which kept tumbling down, how the hearthstone came into your keeping. Forty years beneath a shingled roof, you kept the child fed and the house in place when my spouse was dying. If friend were a larger word than family, it would suffice. Her lamp remains. Every day it grants the same wish. Be my history. Survive me. And I'll end with pistachios. What do I know about us that is not mundane and incredible? I see our appetites, our frustrations, our death, our hope for someone, preferably ourselves, to name how we experienced without unique claim to any of it, salted pistachios. <laughs> Shells pinching the tongue, the mouth salt lined, alerting the brain to possibilities, sea breeze, sea sickness, the moist remains clinging like a day at the boardwalk, the end of that day, when to be tired means well spent, and the body says, no more pistachios, <laughs> and give me more. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been just fabulous and wonderful, and I think we will all enjoy this break and returning to hear more of Hannah's students reading. So what I'm going to ask is for everyone to go out into the um, hallway, during the foyer of the Community Center Library, this direction. You can follow me. Okay, um, I think we're ready to start part two, and um, so let's get going. I'm, I'm eating for Dorian as well. I, 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 I promised that I would, so I'm doing my part. Welcome back for part two, and away we go. Um, Mills College, Hana. I, I went to Mills, I will say unabashedly, I went to Mills because of you. I had seen your poems before, and I thought, I hope I get into this MFA program. When I did, I was ecstatic, um, and I was so happy that I left before you left the program. I was like, oh, thank heavens, thank heavens. Um, so I'm going to read some books, uh, some books, oh my God, I'm not, <laughs> the, the break sort of, I, I'm hopped up on sugar, I think, from that really nice cake. <laughs> I'm going to read some poems from uh, my book, Ways Behold, which has Hannah's uh, very nimble touch on it, and thinking about which, which pieces, which short pieces to read, I thought about, I wanted something that connects with your own work. I thought, well, the Jewish connection, yes. Thought, well, I, I, and although I thank you for introducing me also to Amichai, whose work I am teaching 
next week. So thank you for that introduction. I thought about New York poems, and then I'm so glad your introduction began when you were talking about the body and such. When I was your student, I read Mrs. Dumpty, and the poems were and are unapologetically sensual. And I thought, this Hannah Bloch, she's something special, this Hannah Bloch. And she was, and she is, and all signs are, she will continue to be. So, <laughs> yahoo. Um, this first poem, <laughs> Luxuria, uh, it references Emily Dickinson, a little poetry, a little uh, luxury. And as I'm sure Hannah and others of you may know, the word luxury has its roots in the Latin word luxuria which means, as it does today, luxury and excess, but it had also a different meaning back in the day, so luxuria. Lately, I've been wanting more luxury in my life. Not diamond earrings or a yacht, but luxury in the older Roman sense. Not extravagance, but its indulgent twin, lust. When Emily Dickinson crooned, wild nights should be our luxury, might I but more tonight in thee. Her cruising needed no other craft. Until such luxury sails into my own life, I'll embrace other pleasures of the sea. Wet sand beneath my soles, rogue waves, saltwater pools that catch the edge of my skirt, making me shiver slightly. One very short poem, if luxury can have two senses, so can Victor. Uh, of course, it's a man's name in Victor as in victory. Perhaps the female equivalent is Gloria. We don't know, but anyway. Bastille Day Parade. From a cafe on the Champs-Élysées, I watch tanks enter Paris, drive wind into awnings as horses' hooves strike stone, spark fire. The waiter returns to take my order, Victor with his single silver stud. <laughs> and then one, one last poem in the interest of, of time, and I'm looking forward to hearing these other wonderful Millsian readers and writers, and so happy to be reconnecting. Um, so the body can be a wonderful, sensual thing. Sometimes, of course, the body falls ill. Um, as my own parents now reach a quite advanced age, there's this grappling with uh, mortality that happens. It would be so nice if it, we could easily embrace the cycle of life, you know, hakuna matata, right? But more easily said than done, I think. And there, there's something to be said for a feistiness, which I think leads to this resilience too. So um, I've decided in this poem to, well, sort of take the Grim Reaper on and give him a bit of a, a scolding. So the poem is called The Eternal Dunderhead. You dim reaper, <laughs> undiscriminating fool, what a dunce to dispose of life, ficus, grandfather, cat, as if it all were one, lunk-headed leveler, scat, take only your chum, time, and that term, lifeline. Things are round, things return, think perennials, think full moons, even winter brings revival. Thanksgivings with the family gathered, laughing at an uncle who took what we called forever to do the carving. December sledding in Christopher Morley Park, New York, my father holding on to my brother and me as we all careened downhill, lugging the toboggan back up the slopes again until dark fell heavy upon us, my mother ready with cocoa and butter toast, as we trekked melting snow through the doorway and shivered off the cold. Why should such warm moments end, you simple-minded summoner? The family lessened, my parents bent with the effects of time, unmistakable in my life too. Any half-wit knows the loved and needed shouldn't perish with the rest. Let villains go. Let roaches lose their durability. But let the beloved outlast boulders, pyramids, gold, breaking only like waves that crash against the pier, then rush to converge again. Thank you. Hi, Toby Bielowski, Mills 95, MA in Lit. 
This is such a great evening. It, it is like a camp reunion. <laughs> camp Hana, I love it. <laughs> we, we should have a cheer or a chant or a song or something. This poem is for a restaurant that was one of my haunts when I was a student at Mills. Um, it was called Veggie Food over here on Vine Street. It, it, I know. <laughs> It closed down recently. Now it's like a paleo place, paleo place. But it was an odd little place. But um, anyway, we miss it. Veggie House in Berkeley. During the wait for takeout chow mein, everything turns awkward. The tiny, greasy-walled restaurant is so empty, it's cavernous. Trying not to look drunk, I succeed only in looking sad. <laughs> A sharp rattle as she folds the top of the paper bag. You want fork? Something? The food smells good, as it will be. Soft noodles soaking in sauce, singed here and there against the pan. Hiding bamboo shoots, shiitake, bok choy. Embarrassed by her question, the strange tinge of gentleness in her voice, I shake my head, force a smile, grip the bag, can think only of getting the door handle in my hand, of the cold air, the dark street, how much I don't want a fork or anything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because I'm now a teacher, too, of writing, I um, thought I'd read a teaching poem. Um, but my students aren't, aren't always as friendly to writing or writing not as friendly to them as I think many of us were in Hannah's class. Um, so this one is called, The Homework is Leaving Home. Who uses these words? Pairs of eyes glare at the book, at me, all snark. The words glare back at the eyes, at me, at their own pages. No one, I say. No one in the home you left this morning. Between lands, languageless, my classroom is a customs house. What are you bringing in? They stare at the book, at me, unaware how to declare vocabulary. Um, I'm Rebecca Edwards, and uh, Mills 94 overlapped with Toby, uh, and it does feel wonderful to be here. Um, Hannah, I was thinking, I was sitting here looking at everybody, I was thinking about this weekend I went back to a reunion at my old martial arts school, and there is a title for someone, your title changes when you, when you are a teacher in this tradition, you're a sifu, but when you're students have their own students, you become a sigung. And I was looking around, I was like, we should have some name for that for poets. Like, you have, you have become a teacher of poets who are a teacher of poets who have poets. This was amazing. Um, all right, so, very quickly. A cupboard full of other people's ginger jars. San Francisco, 1993. Sophia, which is zero. It was empty. The smartest kid in kindergarten is crying over zero. Something that means nothing. The teacher tries a marker, a, a placeholder. But at home, where there was someone, there is no one. No sign figures that. 20 years later, she knows a lot of dead people. Grammar rendering what zero couldn't. Threshold of hearing, water's freezing point, first patient of the hypothesis, center of the chemical galaxy. He can't remember who is dead or not. He remembers when he first realized he could forget. He was five. In a station wagon crossing the desert, he was counting birds and telephone poles, how many between departure and arrival, and suddenly he remembered he'd forgotten what he'd tasted for breakfast. Quantity and order 
had lost him oranges and toast. The positional notation. Making room in the cupboard, scrubbing the stained contact paper inherited from previous tenants who must have cared for blue or why else the checks and roses, the counters cluttered with what has been removed and must be put back, the geometry of rupture, jars collect, the dead's tea kettle, cookbook, whistle, something to hold, not a place, but in the hand. And then I have a poem in here that was actually a poem I started writing um, in Hannah's class. And it was the first poem I showed to Hannah. And you did not know this, but it was a test at the time. It's now been revised, but at the time it was a test and I showed it to you and I was waiting for your response. And you said with great delight, oh, it's both a mystical poem and a sex poem. And I was like, yes, <laughs> we are now working. <laughs> um, so this is how it ended up turning out many years later. <clears throat> Speaking in tongues, night's seaweed, shift of eucalyptus, the salts rattle, babbles infinite caresses. Give me this mouth. Fish schools of tongues, each tossing one gritty syllable of your name. Thank you. That was beautiful. My name is Zoe Francesca. I graduated from Mills in 1995. And I'm going to read three short poems that kind of go together. And um, the only thing you need to know is that the word Moshiach means Messiah in Hebrew. Elijah's Visit A young man came to my door asking for a hot shower. He stood in the slanting rain on a cold winter night with a dirty face. Inside, the children watched TV like children gathered round a fire long ago. What if this man was an angel or a prophet? I would have let him in, turned on the hot water, let it rain down like a shower of kisses, chanting, will none of us ever feel cold again? But I shook my head with a glance back at the children around the screen. I don't know you. I don't trust you. You can't come in. Moshiach's reply. It was hailing, and I clothed myself in rags. I didn't believe it at first when she refused to open the door. I saw how in her heart she really believed I would come someday and drink the wine in the cup on the porch, the cup with my name on it. <laughs> she looked through the curtain and shook her head. No, I said through the door, wait. She backed away. Hey, it's me, I shouted. She went to the phone. Five minutes later, her neighbor came over to send me away. He glared at me. So I came back after an hour. I saw her husband come home on his bike. Let me in, I said to him. I just want a shower. There's a church across the park, he said. So I waited some more. I walked by every few days. I even parked an old RV in front of their house and <laughs> camped out there. I lit small fires with pieces of trash in the parking lot next door. Finally, I gave up. When I left, the sun came out, the last day of my visit to Portland, Oregon. It's a short season. The race is on to pick the fruit, eat the fruit, can the fruit, freeze the fruit. In Oregon, each child is a cherry tomato waiting to burst with zeal, bright red in the face of day, staying awake as long as there's sunlight to spur her on, 
One more picnic. One more game. Another trip to the beach or the lake, tripping over herself on the way to the ice cream truck. So turn on the sprinkler. Turn on the hose. Get caked in mud and grass. Take the scent of berries or the sound of bees and paint them on like a bridal tattoo. So heavy and dark, the traces won't wear off in the months of cold, hard rain. Thanks. Hi, I'm Joan Gelfand, uh, MFA 96, and I think everybody said what I wanted to say about Hana. I'll just say one thing is that I saw you read in Oakland at the Coffee Gallery a million years ago, and it was such a great role model. So thank you for just being. Uh, I'm going to start with, uh, I know why Sylvia Plath put her head in the oven. That morning, Ted packed his briefcase. He drove with a poet's gravity over the mountain of dishes, the sinking feeling, leftovers. That morning, she woke up on the bathroom floor. She woke with snatches of poetry and a raging head, but the babies needed breakfast and poems evaporated like English fog lifting off the Devon trees the oven. It was the confluence of things. It was the confluence and the coincidence, everything gone wrong. She'd been frightened and losing too long. She'd been losing when she was supposed to be winning all those long years between 8 and 30, college, scholarships, but she misplaced things. And besides, she missed her daddy. Besides, how should one live with Ted, complete the competing desire for a little madness, the sublime, the constant need, 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 as he dreams of Alyssa, his well-paid job, while staring at babies, burnt toast and teacups. Burnt toast in teacups, she ponders working, but still, the wine glasses, the spills, the laundry piled as nasty as traffic, the Devon fog, the lost poems, the mourning and the laundry, the futility of it all. And I'm just going to read one more because we were told three minutes. Cafe. I never intended to fritter an afternoon, espresso in hand, beret cocked to the left. It's simply a posture much too obvious, to Sartre and de Beauvoir, to poseur. But in spring, logic takes a hike with reason, and common sense gets on the bus, <laughs> leaving us stranded at the intersection of high and falutin. <laughs> like, like a spring storm without warning, I long for the peripheral scrim of conversation, the burst of sun on someone else's awning, mothers strolling, pushing babies yawning, toddlers riding bikes. I'm in the swell, the beautiful wave of budding humanity. I blend in handily, as necessary as the grocery. I'm a backdrop, part of the scenery, a fount of industry to be noticed and not noticed, like the newly-leaved willow singing full-throated to the April breeze. I'm Lisa Michaels, and I did my MFA with Hannah at Mills from 90 to 92, but I defected and wrote uh, a memoir and a historical novel. I'm going to read you a really short piece of prose, I promise, very short. Um, I tried to use everything you taught me. I once had my photograph in Life magazine. It was November 1969. I was three years old. 
Under the heading Parting Shots is a picture of me carrying a Viet Cong flag across a patch of trampled grass. Light shines through, through the flag, two silky panels with a star in the center. I look highly serious, hunched over to counter the weight of the long pole, wearing a short dress and little brown work boots, a pint-sized protester, trudging along, head down, my chin slung forward in, con in concentration. The editors at Life wrote a poem to go with the picture, which they called The Burden of Protest. Is toting a Viet Cong flag in a war demonstration the bag of a child or a parent? We'd say someone's errant. This kid should be off playing tag. It's a smarmy piece of copy. Never a good idea to take the moral high ground in a limerick. <laughs> <laughs> Notably, the poem took a pot shot at my mother, who in the editor's mind had been conspicuously absent, having loaded me up with my ideological burden and disappeared. But my mother says she was there that day, and the picture lied. I had picked up the flag on my own. Some mothers were worried about stuff going on at those rallies, but me, a nice girl from the suburbs, I was a trusting soul. I came to pick you up from your dad, and there you were, dancing around with that flag. Your dress, you can't see this from the picture because it's black and white, was red velvet, a real thick velvet, and some part of the flag was red, and you looked gorgeous. They found the one shot where you looked burdened, but really, you were having a blast, and the photographer knew it. The first time I saw this picture was in my father's house. I must have been eight or so. He had trimmed away the offending poem, framed the photo in mat board, and typed his own caption. Could it be that at three you caught the spirit of the worldwide movement for socialism and shouted, hey, everybody, wait for me? <laughs> Two months earlier, my father carried that same flag into the Harvard Center for International Affairs, an organization doing war research for the government, and along with 20 of his fellow weathermen ran through the building, dumping over filing cabinets, breaking windows, and tearing out phones. Two months after the picture was snapped, my father would be in prison. When I swung that flag across Boston Common, it was a swath of fabric to me, nothing more. I waved it in a calm between emergencies, one sock up, one down, oblivious to what was to come. <laughs> I'm Yiska Rosenfeld, and I came to Mills in 95 and got my MFA in 97. I came, I only applied to one MFA program. Um, I applied for one reason, that's the reason, and it was a great decision. Thank you for your mentorship, and also thank you for your generosity after graduation. I think that's something that's really rare, the way that you continue to be generous and warm and stay connected to your students. Thank you. Um, we're coming on the month of Nisan in the Jewish calendar. This is the, the springtime month. It's the first of the calendar year from the biblical perspective when the Israelites um, are, are birthed, um, flee from Egypt, and it's the month of Passover. And it was also a time when I was just beginning to explore uh, conception, conceiving as a single woman in my 40s. Nisan. In the sea that is the garden, walling the east side of my house, miracles happen in spring. Witness from my bedroom window. Irises that were not blue feathered birds brushing the fence are now. Even when my feet beg, I don't go down. Inner enemies weed up their chariots closing me in. Is this why you brought me here, to die? Daily the garden splits me open. Moses says, be still. Branches glitter and green with voice. All night the rain shakes her tambourines. Morning my anxious dreams drown in the sudden light. At the garden's gate, I leave my shoes, carry only thin moons, unrisen futures, 
asleep on my back. Thank you. Annie Stenzel, BA 89, MFA 92. Um, I have some very short poems, very short. This has an epigraph, uh, the title is The Garden Came First, and the epigraph is Eve Was Framed. <laughs> Perhaps she was already weeding. You know how it is. Step into the yard for a moment because you hear bird song, then glance down at the ground and see weeds everywhere. You have to do something, which means you have to decide. Oxalis or chamomile? Vinca or Bermuda grass, dandelion or morning glory. So, which one was put here on purpose? <laughs> A bit darker here. On witnessing the descent of another into depression. When I say she has taken the veil again, you might grieve for us both. But it's really the veil that has taken her as if a frail vessel came under the hands of its least skillful sailor just as it neared the lee shore. Be afraid. There can be no facile resolution. Think Demeter, but with no prospect of Persephone. When I want a cloudy day, a sunny day will never do. I want it gray so that the lowered clouds backdrop the many Pantone variations on spring green. I want the clouds opaque. I want their margins indistinct with gray sky and bay rolled together sands horizon. I want it bleak and raw, or raw as it can be in California anyway. Slow the dawn down so that morning creeps along and scarcely brightens even by 9 a.m. I want it dark, dark as the clapstick close of your untimely exit from the scene. When someone I admire dies, even somebody I never knew, like you, I want a cloudy day. Oh, gosh, that makes loud noise. All right, I will close with this one called I save the world before I am fully awake. <laughs> it would take longer, surely, to steer the speeding asteroid toward new coordinates that spare this globe from imminent destruction. Or was this the one in which the madman's finger trembles just above the button marked total nuclear annihilation, and I talk him out of it? Or maybe all that happened was I listened to the whispered secret that, once heard, removes the taste for evil from all our hearts. Even assuming a certain elasticity of time, the inevitable acceleration of tempo in dreamscape, how could that astonishing experience have taken place in the mere 10 minutes my snooze alarm allows? <laughs> I want to thank you all so much. This has been wonderful to feel that I understand more about the poets I know and who are friends. And I've met some really wonderful poets tonight through Hana, and, and lots of wonderful things come about because of Hana. Thank you all for coming and joining us in this celebration and beautiful reading. Um, we will have just a, a few minutes, so please, Hannah is going to close the evening as she opened it. Um, there are a few books for sale, so if you want on your way out, there will be a li little bit of time to say good nights and look at books, and thank you so much for coming, and uh, look for our upcoming scheduled events. Okay, I, and if you would like, to uh, leave an address, uh, an email address, 
Um, I'll, I'll make sure there's a paper at the back if there was not already, or, or some of you know how to get in touch with me. All right. Thank you very, very much. It was great. It was just great to be with all of you and, and to see you again. Some of you look so different. <laughs> I guess all of us do, right? All of us do. So I want to close with one poem that is very important to me now, and it's called The Joins. And oh, you know, you know about Kintsugi. You could probably say more about it than I do. K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I, -I, Kintsugi. It's the Japanese art of repairing something, that uh, precious pottery that is broken, repairing it with gold, with, with a kind of lacquer resin that's laced with gold. So if you Google that, you will see the most beautiful examples, and it looks like lightning, gold lightning across these bowls. So this, this honors the history of something that's broken instead of attempting to disguise it. The joins. Kintsugi, and the epigraph is, Kintsugi is the Japanese art of mending precious pottery with gold. What's between us seems flexible as the webbing between forefinger and thumb. Seems flexible, but isn't. What's between us is made of clay, like any cup on the shelf. It shatters easily. Repair becomes the task. We glue the wounded edges with tentative fingers. Scar tissue is visible history, and the cup is precious to us because we saved it. In the art of Kintsugi, a potter repairing a broken cup would sprinkle the resin with powdered gold. Sometimes the joins are so exquisite, they say the potter may have broken the cup just so he could mend it. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you for the cake. Thank you for the wonderful cake. Thank you for your poems. I hope you will all stay in touch. And, and I, I, want, I hope to hear more of your work. And it's just that everybody has flourished so much in this period of time. It's just wonderful to see. Bye-bye.